Let's come to the CPM and Barisan Socialists. Let's look at what he uh, said to Harold Crouch in an interview, Jinping. Mm -hmm. I think at least the first part you will agree. Mm -hmm. uh, Crouch asks, what sort of relationship did the people who became the Barisan Socialists in Singapore have with the people in Southern Thailand at that time? Had there been any contact at all? And Jinping answers, I think among them there were some communists and there were some non-communists. You agree with that? Oh, I'm sorry, you're asking me, do I yes. agree with there were some communists? Do you agree I'm with sure, that? sure there are some communists Thank and non-communists, yeah. Now, next question. How about the formation of the Barisan Socialists? Who initiated it? Sorry, are you asking me or are you reading? I'm actually reading. I'm moving on to a different document, Chen Chen, Chasing Dreams on the Wave's Crest. And this was a question. Uh, can I just point out, in the previous document, there was a definitive question about whether Chin Xiong had contact uh, with, the, with the party. Sure. Um, you can go back to the previous document. Tony Short asks, so... Lim Chin Siong never had any contact with the party in southern Thailand, did he? Now, I can give you the second page. We will find the second page and give it to you. Page 191. Okay. Now, let's look at the next document. This is something that was asked of Yu Chu Yip. Have you read this book, Chasing Dreams on the Waves Crest? Yes. You have. The English translation... Interviewer asks Yu Chu Yip, how about the formation of the Barisan Socialists? Who initiated it? Answer, it was Fong Chan Pek. At first we thought, yes, he made the decision to form the Barisan Socialists on the spot. So Barisan Socialists, according to Yu Chu Yip, was formed by CPM's lead person in Singapore. Have you known of yes, this answer? Yes, this is totally wrong. This, this is, is totally wrong. Absolutely wrong, yes. Do you refer to this anywhere? I have explained that, uh, you know, my, uh, well, my argument is, um, uh, you know, putting together my sources to support my argument. Yes. Why? I mean, this is just totally wrong. He, uh, and it's quite, it's, it's well established in the historiography that Fong Chong Pik uh, had nothing to do with the formation of the Barisan and MCP policy was against the PAP split. Okay. But, uh, this is so this is covered in the you remember uh, side, uh, footnote seven. This footnote is covered seven. there. So, so this particular point is uh, dealt with. Yes, there. it's dealt with. Yes. Thank you. Now, you are aware that at least fifteen former Barisan leaders and activists are known to have lived in the CPM's peace villages. Correct. Yes. And they include, just for the record, Wong Sun Fong and Chan Sun Wing. Both were PAP assemblymen elected in 1959, who then left the PAP in 61 to join the Barisan Socialists, correct? Yes. Now, since we are speaking about Mr. Lim, I've made clear what our position is, but I think we should remind you that both Mr. Lee and more recently in 2015, DPMTO, as well as our ambassador to Australia, in his response to an Australian publication, have said quite clearly that it was a struggle between people on both sides of the ideological divide who were prepared to die for their cause. They were men of courage and determination. And They've made various other points. I think you're aware of it. Yes, I am aware of it. Now, let us now turn to Operation Cold Store. I've told you how you described it. Let's look at the evidence. 
tjene penge? May I suggest the best evidence is the special branch archive rather than Jinping, who was very, very far away from Singapore at this point in time? Well, you can suggest, but I will ask you the question. Okay. Well, and you can for answer. the record, then I'll just say that. Right. Leave it there. And let's look at the evidence that Jinping puts forward. Page 439, February 2, 1963. Confident in the consolidation of his power base and with Malaysia barely seven months away, Lee lowered the boom on CPM. In a pre-dawn thrust, he launched Operation Cold Star, which saw a combined force of local Malayan police conduct an island-wide roundup of alleged communist activists. Working from prepared name lists, the raiding parties managed to seize 115 suspects. The Singapore crackdown we had been expecting for almost four years had, in fact, only materialized after strong pressure on Lee from both Tunku and the British. Our deliberations with Yu Chuyip two years earlier had correctly forecast the event, but had failed to visualize putting in place any form of effective countermeasures. My plea to prepare for the worst had been to no avail. Operation Cold Star shattered our underground network throughout the island. Those who escaped the police not went into hiding. Many fled to Indonesia. I suggest to you this is one of the most direct and relevant pieces of evidence one can get. And you can agree or disagree. Hmm. The most, no, I disagree. The special branch document, special branch conducted the arrest. Their documents So what Jinping says is false. What Jinping says is from his perspective. Yes, and it is false. No, it's from his perspective. Okay, what he says is untrue, factually. Factually, there, okay. Just so, this part, Operation Cold Store shattered our underground network throughout the island. That is untrue. Oh, it's quite possible that Operation Cold Store shattered what remaining MCP network remained in Singapore. It's, that's quite possible. So what he says that, uh, it is be. true. But, of course, he doesn't know, right? He's very far no. away. I'm asking you what he says. Operation Cold Star shattered our underground network throughout the island. Is that true or is that not true? Special branch interrogations of the detainees of Operation Cold Star found no evidence of uh, any uh, underground and, communist network. And therefore, network. your view is that this is not true? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I mean, yes. Any evidence, any reason why you think uh, Ch Jinping, the, as a Secretary General, would be engaging in such untruths? Uh, same reason anyone writes their memoirs, right? They want to put forward, as he calls it, it's my side of history. So this may be something he genuinely believes, right? And, uh, he, you know, in writing this is what the early 90s, at that disconnect, he may genuinely believe that that's what happened. Mm -hmm. But the documents by Special Branch on the ground justifying why Colesaw happened show no evidence. And the interrogations of the detainees that followed after detentions also found no evidence of any coherent communist conspiracy to subvert uh, the government. Have you explained Singapore. anywhere, including your PhD thesis, why this statement should be disregarded? I have explained, I have made my case based on the documents, uh, the British no, Special Branch. that's not the question. The question is, have you explained why the statement by Jinping should be given no value or weight? No. You didn't see the need to? No. Thank you. Let us now look at the British archives. You have repeatedly referred to them. Does this include the special branch documents? I will show you the documents that I want to refer to. Okay. First, let's look at 22 September 1959. The note from D.S. Humphreys, tab 34. Paragraph 21. The party is illegal and is organized on a cell basis. 
the Singapore organization is believed to embrace over 400 persons. There are, in addition, several thousand sympathizers and communist-inclined members of front organizations. It is, however, impossible to estimate its real strength. For tactical reasons, the Communist Party is in favor of legal activity through the extreme left wing of the PAP led by Lim Chin Siong, who is almost certainly a secret party member. Would you say this document is relevant? Yes, and I have interrogated this document and many documents like this to explain. May I explain? Do you say that anywhere in any of your publications? Um, I'm sure I have cited many documents, because this no. sort of paragraph is all over the place, this kind of, you know, so maybe no. not this specific document, but other documents which express so the same sentiments have been, uh, let's just have been to cited this. and discussed. Whether you have interrogated this particular document, this particular paragraph 21, and set out your viewpoints in any of your publications. This particular document? Yes. You do realize there are thousands of documents, right? I do realize. And I'm asking so about I've this particular others. document. So not this particular document. No, I don't. If you give me the file, could you give me the file number and I can look it up? But I am not. I, off the top of my head, I don't think this particular document. But you'll have to give me the file number. It starts with CO1030, probably. CO1036-656. 103056. Thank you. I'll check. Paragraph 21. No, it does not appear uh, to be cited. Thank you. Hmm. Now, this, you know who is D.S. Humphreys? Uh, yes, if I remember correctly, he was the, wait, was Humphreys um, special branch, um, or was he... Um, police. Maybe you could. Sorry, it's been a long day. Mm, I just want to refresh ask my memory. You, uh, if you don't know, it doesn't matter. Hmm? So we have it, a direct statement by Mr. Humphreys, September 1959, saying that Lim Chin Siong is almost certainly a party member and yes. what the Communist Party of Malaya is uh, how it is structured and what sort of strength it has. Yes. Uh, you don't, you cannot recall who is Mr. Humphreys, and you have no record of dealing with this document anywhere in your publications. Yes. Thank you. Can I point out the, uh, may let's I move on. comment on that paragraph? Let's move on. I, oh. This is what I needed. Now, 1962, telegram number 582 from Lord Selkirk, to the Secretary of State for the Colonies. Let's look at that. May I have the file number, please? It's a... CO1030-160. stroke 160? Yes. Thank you. Oh. Yes. I'm quoting, I said I recognized all along that a threat was presented by the communists in Singapore. Para five. I had not, however, previously, and this is December 1962, 14 uh, December you, 1962. I think you mean 1160, no 160. You're right, 1160. Right. Thank you. I, para five, I said I had recognized all along that a threat was presented by the communists in Singapore. I had not, however, previously been convinced that a large number of arrests were necessary to counter this threat. Recently, however, new evidence has been produced about the extent of the communist control of the Barisan Socialists, and also there had been indications that the communists might resort to violence if the opportunity occurred. Recent statements by the Barisan Socialists and Party Rakyat, Party Rakyat supporting the revolt in Brunei confirmed this, Accordingly, Her Majesty's government was prepared to see action taken in Singapore, provided it was made clear publicly that all three governments accepted joint responsibility and the action was taken very quickly. Now, let's look at paragraph 9.
sorry, I made a mistake here. Let me see. If you look at paragraph uh, 2, A, he then sets out the factors in favor. Subparagraph B, reason security intelligence has shown more clearly than ever before that the Barisan socialists are communist controlled and that although they see at least no feasible alternative to constitutional tactics, they have weighed the merits of more direct action and would not hesitate to take it if it would pay. Mm -hmm. And then he sets out the arguments that they had previously, which were against direct action. And at paragraph four, he sets them out again. And paragraph five, we have, I think he sets out his conclusion and he talks about the steps to be taken. Now, you know that Selkirk started out skeptical about the, uh, any, act, any action to be taken against uh, what the special branch considered to be communists. Agree? He started out skeptical. Yes. This telegram taken on the face of it, suggests that now he was convinced that they needed to be arrested, correct? On the face of it, it does suggest that. Thank I you. do interrogate this document, if you would give me the chance to explain it. Well, I think what we need to do is to move on. And Whoa, then, come on, you've asked me to interrogate so many documents. This is a document I have actually interrogated and I explain, you know, in great detail in my yes, work the issues with this document and now we're not Dr. going to Tom, address it we, at all. We will address it, but in a while. Let me just run through Is that a, a promise? Documents. We will we will come back to this document? We can come back to it and no, if you want to come will. back it, we we'll, will come back to this will. document. Okay, thank okay. you, I'll hold you to that. We thank will you. come back. Now, Let's look at, uh, which I'm sure you have interrogated as well. If you can look at your ARI working paper, page 19. See the third and fourth paragraphs? Mm -hmm. You suggest that the main reason for the arrest uh, cited by Selkirk was to give to the Federation the arrest they so badly wanted, correct? Yes. And in that context, you refer to two documents. Yes. They are in footnotes 124 and 125. And you say page, at page 18, if you look at page 18, you look at uh, the sentence to which you give footnote 124. 135, sorry, not 125. 124 and 125. Uh, Look at page 18. Oh, sorry. Um, Faced with this scenario, Barisan members were deeply frustrated. I'm talking about the text. The very last paragraph at page 18. Uh, oh, sorry, I thought you were referring to the, no. you said the arrest they so badly craved, right, earlier? It, that's that on page 19. I've moved on from there. Oh, okay. And I'm referring to two other documents. So now you're going back to page, to page 18. 18. I'm reading to you your last paragraph. 
Based, faced with this scenario, Barzan members were deeply frustrated. They had adhered to constitutional methods, believing that as in Kenya and Yasaland, the British would not hesitate to use violent suppression in Singapore as long as the law remained on the books. But even if the ISC was abolished, the referendum demonstrated that constitutional processes could not be, could be manipulated. And then you say that you know, hostile progressive forces could, uh, over, hostile forces uh, which are hostile to progressive forces could counter that. And then Lim Chin Siong saying that they must carry on with the constitutional struggle. He, he urged them to yes. continue peaceful long-term uh, constitutional you, struggle, and the party agreed that the only option was to yes. keep using peaceful constitutional processes with the aim of winning elections to the federal parliament and building a multiracial progressive coalition. Yes. yes. Now, that's what you say. Look at um, the fourth paragraph in page 19 again. 19. <clears throat> the second sentence, Barisan members had complained that the constitution was pointless if it was so easily manipulated, asking if there was another way forward. What is the another way forward that you are referring to? Uh, the meetings were held to discuss uh, strategy in the wake of the I'm referendum. simply asking you, what is the another way forward that you are referring to? What they were asking for. They were asking if there was another way. So they were not having in mind any specific way? Uh, they were considering many options, yeah. Can you tell us the options they were considering? Um, the other ways? Um, well... You refer to one another way. What was it? Yeah, I referred to one another way, sorry. You say... Asking if there was another way forward? Yes, that's the question. Is there another way if, yes. the, if the PAP can so easily rig a referendum and if the constitution... I understand all that preamble. What yes. is the other way? There is no specific other what way. What were the other ways discussion. they were considering? There were you know, a whole range of options. Can tell us. You know, including, including, I think what you're, you're asking me is... And what you want to avoid answering. <laughs> yes. Non-constitutional struggle which they then decided was off the table. They would Thank continue you. to adhere to peaceful constitutional struggle. Right. You imply here that Selkirk willfully chose to interpret the evidence as calls to abandon constitutional action. And basically you're saying Selkirk had no grounds whatsoever for coming to his conclusion, correct? For his, which conclusion? For his conclusion that there were calls to abandon constitutional action. Uh, I think if you look at the document, he no, says... I'm his, just asking you what No, he, that's not his conclusion, that's what right. I'm saying. His conclusion is that the Barisan is uh, communist controlled. All right. Now, let's look at what you say here. In six lines... Selkirk added that the reason intelligence demonstrated communist control of the Barisan and that Lim had never explicitly ruled out violent action. Your suggestion there is that Selkirk had no basis to come to that conclusion? That the Barisan was communist controlled? No. And that, that that's what it, I said. He, his recent intelligence demonstrated that communists control the Barisan. Yes, I argue that he has no way to make that link. And secondly, he had no basis to conclude that they might go into violent action. He, Lim never explicitly ruled out violent action. That's, that's what I wrote there. I'm asking you what you're saying about Selkirk. Yeah. So your point is, Selkirk says Lim never explicitly ruled out violent action. And reason intelligence 
demonstrated communist control of the Barisan. So you accept that Lim never explicitly ruled out violent action, but you say Selkirk was wrong, that reason intelligence demonstrated communist control of the Barisan. Would that be an accurate so, way of reading that, uh, coupled sorry, with what you this said? This is very confusing. You, so Selkirk makes two big points. Yes. One, reason intelligence shows that the Barisan is communist controlled. Right. Two, Lim never explicitly rules out violent What do you say action. about, what and are you both saying are, that? So what I'm saying is that um, the evidence for these two points are accounts of two post-referendum Barisan meetings. I understand. Yes. And, and do you think that Selkirk was correct in his interpretations? Uh, well, he, he's incorrect in that the intelligence demonstrated communist control of the Barisan. Right. Uh, but it is true that Lim doesn't explicitly rule out violent action. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. And um, your assertion is that there was unanimous agreement among the Barisan members to keep following the constitutional agreement? Well, that's because these are accounts of meetings. Uh, that's what was reflected in the account. Okay. Yeah. Let's look at the documents. You have referred to these notes. This is meeting at Barisan Socialist Headquarters, 23rd of September, 1962. Let's look at paragraph one first. The meeting was arranged by members of the organizing subcommittee to interpret and discuss new lines of policy and tactics laid down by the Secretary General, Lim Chin Siong, in his speech at the Barisan Socialist. Okay, so that's the purpose of the meeting. Para two, at the meeting which lasted for most of the day, source reports that Chok Ka Tong, the party CEC, presided. He had recently taken over the effective control of the organizing subcommittee of the party from Fong Si Swan, who now spends more time in the direction of activities in the trade union field. Fong Sui Suan, however, still retains the post of the secretary of this subcommittee and is still responsible for the overall control. Okay, so that's paragraph two. And then over the page, paragraph three, the theme chosen for the discussion was the first of three main principles laid down by Lim Chin Siong. Quote, so long as the conditions for peaceful constitutional struggle, sorry, methods of struggle remain available to us, we will persist in the peaceful constitutional method of struggle. Lim Chin Siong had said it in a speech, and they were considering it at this meeting. Para 4, Chok opened the discussion by reviewing the history of the struggle in Malaya and elsewhere and said that along the road of fighting for national liberation, the people of our country in different circumstances have produced different forms of struggle. He cited the armed struggle against the Japanese during the war and against the ruling classes afterwards. There he is referring to the period of the emergency, correct? Yes, the sir. armed struggle yep. afterwards. Yep. Thank you. More recently, the constitutional struggle was being waged against a reactionary clique in the Federation capital who were utilizing all sorts of ordinances to suppress the people's demands. Now we go to para six. Tan He Kim then spoke. One of his main points was that uh, while some people say that in communist countries there is a so-called dictatorship of the proletariat, or people's democratic dictatorship, the parliamentary system of the bourgeoisie in the colonial capitalist countries was in fact a system of dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. And then he talks about Singapore. And then para seven. This is Tan Hee Kim. He says, 
it would be wrong to think that because after a century of struggle, the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie still prevailed, the democratic people's opposition was of no avail. He asserted that oppression is beneficial and not harmful to us because in the long run it increased our mass following. Outwardly, it might appear that they had been suppressed, but each time they suffered a setback, the tide of their struggle would flow again in ever greater strength. Constitutional opposition enabled them to express, expose the ruling class and its system, train our masses and our cadres, and educate and organize and unite the people. The political consciousness of the masses and the organization would thereby strengthen so that when the stage of struggle arrives, these masses will serve our purpose. Doesn't this suggest that the constitutional struggle was a means to an end? You use the constitutional means to expose their limitations, raise political consciousness in order to, for the eventual stage of struggle. Agree? So sorry, what was that question again? You're saying the constitutional struggle is a means to an end? Yes. Yeah, it, the struggle is anti-colonial. It's a means to get rid of the British. I didn't say colonial or anti-colonial. Right. So please listen to the question. Yes. The, they will use constitutional means as a means to an end. They will expose the limitations of the reactionaries, they will raise political consciousness through this constitutional struggle and until they reach the next stage of the struggle. Agree? That's what you are saying. That, yeah. I'm not sure what your point is, but that seems to be what you're saying, yes. Thank you. Paragraph 8. Other speakers discuss the theme of constitutional struggle on similar lines. One suggested that class contradictions in a colonial country would reach an explosive stage one day. Another claimed that in the present international situation in which two social systems were fighting for final victory, the socialist system is on our side. There were seven socialist countries in Europe today while in Asia, China was a major power as well as a socialist country which could deal a blow at or act as a curb upon the USA. Progressive forces amongst the people in the Western countries were rising to oppose their governments, and the Afro-Asian countries provided a formidable opposition to colonialism. Their victory would help our cause. Now that's the background, but the model that they seem to be looking at are China and seven socialist countries in Europe, correct? And Afro-Asian countries. Yes. Yeah. Can you Former tell us which are the seven socialist countries in Europe they were looking at? No. Thank you. Paragraph 9. The speaker warned that constitutional methods of struggle would not necessarily ensure victory in the long run, as was shown by the experience of other countries which had won their independence from the Western powers by these means. And then he refers to India. In different circumstances, other countries such as the USSR, China, North Korea, North Vietnam, and Cuba had adopted the method of armed struggle or armed revolution. The USSR could not have used the peaceful constitutional method of struggle at the time of revolution because she was surrounded by capitalist countries. The present international situation, however, was different because there now existed a bulwark of countries safeguarding world peace which provided conditions for a peaceful constitutional struggle. So he's contrasting with the USSR and saying there is a, a system in place and there are some conditions for peaceful constitutional struggle. Then paragraph 11, Neo's conclusion was that it would not be possible to make a final decision as to whether the revolution must be brought about by armed or constitutional struggle, since different methods were appropriate to different environments. But in Singapore today, the constitutional method should be maintained. Good leftist organization of the masses might, however, provide a different situation 
after another five years. So essentially, for now, we'll take the constitutional method, but let's prepare for an armed struggle if necessary in another five years, correct? Oh, if necessary, sure. Thank armed you. Armed struggle against the uh, occupying and uh, colonial power is, uh, you know, legitimate. And the established system of governance. Against and a colonial power, that's right. the established system, a colonial right. occupying power, and, uh, Britain. Malaysia came about, will there be a colonial power? If Malaysia came about, would there yes. be a colonial power? Yes. Um, it depends on the structure of Malaysia, right? The Is Malaysia Singapore that occupied was uh, proposed. by uh, the Malaysia that was proposed. Well, um, I think there were colonial aspects to it. Singapore was underrepresented, and that's what the Barisan argued. They were okay. underrepresented. So we will take that as your yeah. views. Okay. Now, so you say that uh, if Singapore was independent, then this reference to possible armed struggle doesn't apply, correct? Yes, of course, it's anti-colonial. Right. Now, paragraph 12, mm. Chong Ka Tong summed up the views of the various comrades under the following heading. The deceitful and hypocritical system in which they were waging their constitutional struggle should be recognized so that they were under no illusions. They must themselves determine the form their struggle should take. Basically, armed struggle is the highest form of struggle, but whether it should adopt it or not would depend on the entire international situation. Experience elsewhere had shown that when the masses had reached the point where they were capable of suppressing reactionaries, it was questionable whether the peaceful constitutional struggle should still be adhered to. So in summary, we say carry on with the constitutional struggle, but when the masses were capable of overthrowing the reactionaries, then can go on to the armed struggle, correct? Uh, if armed struggle is necessary, yeah. Against Paragraph 13. colonial power. Now, did they say it's against the colonial power there? Well, the struggle is an anti-colonial struggle. No, That's what I mean, the struggle is. Is there anything here which says it's anti-colonial? Uh, much earlier on, on in the document, they talked about anti-colonialism and freedom, so it's safe to assume they're talking about anti-colonialism. Isn't it safe to assume that they're talking about taking over power in the way the communists will understand? Well, they're not communists. There's no connection well, here. There's no, there's no I'm mention of communism here, right? I'm Which is my point about Selkirk. Selkirk says it shows they're communist control. The, the word communist doesn't even appear. Dr. Right Tom, yes. communism and communists appears all over this building, all over this document. Mm -hmm. If you look mm -hmm. at USSR, China, North Korea, North Vietnam, Cuba, those were the models they were looking at. And at they're one also stage. looking at socialist countries in Europe and Afro-Asia. So and I asked you which socialist countries, mm -hmm. and you say you don't know. I don't know. Right. Isn't it clear that they were referring to those which were part of the Soviet bloc? Possibly. Are and there they were also referring to Afro-Asia. Were there any other socialist countries in Europe other than those in, in 1961, other than those in the Soviet bloc? Uh, depends how you define socialism, but based on my understanding of your question, no. And therefore, clearly, all the examples that you see they refer to are what we would understand as communist countries, right? Afro-Asia? Leave out Afro-Asia well, for the time but being. There's, the Afro-Asia is in there as Europe, well. We can't Europe just selectively and, uh, leave China, out. Europe and Asia, they are all communist countries. Europe and Asia. Um, China, China, North Korea, North, North Vietnam. Korea, North Vietnam, yeah, sure. Thank you. Now, doesn't that make it quite clear that they are talking about, regardless of whether there is a colonial power or not, mm. in five years, after we have worked with the masses, we use them and we use armed struggle if necessary to take over power. Yes? No, it's about uh, okay. winning independence and the, the anti-colonial struggle. Right. Now, let's define it, keep it to anti-colonial struggle for the time being. Let's um, look at paragraph 13. 
Experience elsewhere showed that there was no country in the world which had attained a thorough success in revolution through constitutional processes. And that throughout Southeast Asia, including Malaya, the ruling classes would not lightly hand over political power to the leftists. What do you think that means? Well, exactly what it says. The ruling classes would not lightly hand over political power to the leftists. Yes. Yes. So even if it's, the country is independent, they do not believe that the ruling classes will hand over power to the leftists, correct? The ruling classes refer to the colonial classes in this case. This is 1962. And this is 1962. And it goes on to say, nevertheless, everyone disliked bloodshed and the use of arms. Doesn't it yeah. And the question say, of whether it be necessary we are arguing to this. resort to them would not depend on the people, but on the reactionary government of the bourgeoisie, which is their position that if the colonial government used force of arms against them, they must pick up force of arms against the... They must pick up arms to resist the colonial government and win independence. Let me remind you of a few things. Go back to paragraph 6. One of his main points was that while some people say that in communist countries there is a so-called dictatorship of the proletariat or people's democratic dictatorship, so he is referring to the communist model there, correct? Yeah, yes. Go yeah. back to paragraph five. Well, there's a lot more in that paragraph. May I just point out? He's a there is a lot more. Yes. But let's go back to paragraph five. Chong Ka Tung proceeded to cite the constitutional and armed struggle of the leftists against the reactionaries in other parts of Southeast Asia. In every quarter, the strength of the people finally prevailed over that of the reactionary forces. However, this experience, for instance, of the CPI, Communist Party of India in Kerala, showed that the reactionary cliques would not lightly hand over political power to the genuine leftist political party. India at that time was independent, about 10 1947, mm -hmm. it's about 14, 15 years, correct? Yes. They are saying that the reactionary forces in India will not hand over power to the leftist forces even if constitutional means were used, correct? He's saying that the example of the Communist Party of India in Kerala showed that the reactionary cliques would not likely hand over political power to... And we are not talking about an anti-colonial struggle there, correct? Yeah, yes. Thank you. So yes. does that inform you that what they are saying is that when the, even if the colonials leave, they will leave behind structures and reactionaries who will not lightly hand over power to the leftist forces, correct? You're referring to neo-colonialism? I'm referring to a country that becomes independent. Mm -hmm. And I'm referring to, <clears throat> for example, by reference to what they are saying, the analogy of India, and in fact, he expressly says from the analogy, he drew the lesson for their own genuine leftist political party in Singapore. That's in paragraph five. Their point is, even if Singapore were to become independent, mm -hmm. and there's no more anti-colonial struggle, the structures that will be left behind will be reactionary and these reactionary structures will never hand over power willingly to the left. And that is the lesson for Singapore. Agree? It is entirely possible. Thank um, you. The, the point I made with this document was A, that there is no evidence of communist control, and B, that they do agree at the end to continue following peaceful constitutional we'll struggle. We'll come to all of that, but yes. the point is... Now, by reference, your argument was not used by special branch to justify Cold Store, if that's what I'm you're wondering. Not, I'm just referring to what you have said. 
No, you're referring to what he has said. No, I'm referring to what you have said. I'm taking you through the document which you have relied upon. Yes, yes. And putting it to you. Yes. Now, therefore, the references, for example, in paragraph 11, in the context of everything else that has been said is not restricted to an anti-colonial struggle, but even if Singapore became independent, good leftist organization or the masses might, however, provide for a different situation, including an armed struggle, because these people who take over from the colonials, even in an independent situation, will probably not give us power. That's clear based on what I've taken you through. Agree? Um, I have not addressed that in my work, but sure, I'm, it's hypothetically. Well, I'm not possible. talking about hypothetical. I'm talking about what they are saying. You're trying to read very much into what they're saying. I don't no, know you whether read your an interpretation is correct. struggle into what they are saying, and yes. I'm pointing out to you, reading it on the face of it, the reference to Kerala is very important. Mm -hmm. The reference to colonial masters leaving behind structures which mm. and reactionaries in power yes. who will prevent mm -hmm. leftists from taking over. That means in a situation where the country becomes independent, you right. will still and, not and get not democratic. Because uh, well, if you look at paragraph 5, he does point out that you know, constitutional processes, uh, if we can go back to con paragraph 5, for example, yes. uh, they do make reference to uh, manipulation of constitutional processes yes. by the PAP. Right. So for yes. those reasons, even if, it's fairly obvious, even if there was a uh, independence, the, they go on with the constitutional processes for a few years and then be prepared to move into armed struggle if necessary. I mean, that's obvious. I wouldn't say that's obvious. It is a possibility. All right. But my argument, as I've said before, is that this document does not demonstrate communist control of the Barisan, and it shows we that they agreed come to, to that, peaceful constitutional So we control. don't need to deal with um, the issues that I haven't yet asked. Mm -hmm. Now, would you say, since they talk in positive terms as a possible model, USSR, China, North Korea... North Vietnam and Cuba, and obviously the seven socialist countries in the Soviet bloc. And Afro-Asia. Would you say they are the models of democracy that you were talking about just now? They are independent countries. Yeah, I didn't ask that, you, because you said, well, the PAP was using all sorts of means, mm -hmm. but would you not see that... Uh, they were referring to countries which were communist dictatorships as yes. a possible model. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. Now, paragraph 15. <clears throat> In, sorry, paragraph 13, I'm sorry. I missed it. Experience... Uh, uh, nice. Experience elsewhere showed that there was no country in the world which had attained a thorough uh, success in revolution through constitutional processes, and that throughout Southeast Asia, including Malaya, the ruling classes would not likely hand over political power to the leftists. Nevertheless, everyone disliked bloodshed and the use of arms, and the question of whether it would be necessary to resort to them would depend not on the people, but on the reactionary government of the bourgeoisie, Today, Lee Kuan Yew still had no army under his command. If one day he would replace the constitutional form of struggle with a military dictatorship so that there would be no need for him to resort to deceit and intimidation anymore, the people themselves, however, detested armed struggle and would only resort to it if compelled to do so. And then, para 14, another speaker said, in the present circumstances in Malaya, they were expanding the struggle through peaceful and constitutional means to obtain political power, but anyhow, 
armed struggle must be used to bring about a complete revolution. So again, what they are saying is, this speaker was saying, you look at the experience throughout Southeast Asia, including Malaya, the ruling classes would not likely hand over political power to the leftists. Statement number one. Statement number two, therefore, armed struggle must be used to bring about a complete revolution. That was a view of one speaker, reading 13 and 14 together. Would you agree? Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? Okay. The point being made in paragraphs 13 and 14 is that the ruling classes will not lightly give up power, hand over political power to the leftists, even if the country becomes independent, because they are referring to all of Southeast Asia. And in the present circumstances in Malaya, they were extending the struggle through peaceful and constitutional means to obtain political power, but armed struggle must be used to bring about a complete revolution. So regardless of, even if a country becomes independent, that particular speaker thought that armed struggle was necessary to bring out about complete revolution. Yes? Yes. Thank you. Now, paragraph 15. Finally, another speaker defined the task of our revolution as consisting of two stages. First, to eliminate colonialism entirely. And the second, to overthrow the semi-feudal society and establish a socialist system. To achieve this aim, the two methods of armed and constitutional struggle were available. And no matter which was chosen, it could not be used alone. Armed struggle would always have to be coordinated with a constitutional method. The bourgeoisie and the petty bourgeoisie would need to be united with the worker and peasant classes. In other words, all those who had suffered from foreign political and economic oppression. Now, what was clear from this speaker is that first stage, there are two stages to this revolution. First stage is the constitutional means. And you, sorry, I rephrase it. The first stage was to eliminate colonialism entirely. And the second stage was to overthrow the semi-feudal system, society and establish a socialist system. And an armed struggle has to be used to bring that about. Right? Yes. Thank you. In fact, therefore, the consensus here was that an armed struggle was likely to be necessary based on your own answers. Agree? But for now, they would adhere to peaceful and constitutional yes. methods. We accept, accept for the that. For first yes. stage, and then yeah. they will take to the armed struggle to complete the revolution. That's what you just agreed to. It seems likely that it's a, an armed struggle is possible. Yes. I wouldn't say that this is any sort of definitive planning meeting for them to assume armed struggle. But uh, given the history of uh, anti-colonialism at that point in time, especially Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, you know, the overthrow of colonialism had necessitated Dr. Armed Tom, struggle. that wasn't yes. the question I asked. The question I asked was there was I, consensus it, yeah. that there will be resort to armed struggle to complete the revolution. If necessary, yes. Yes, yes. yes. And uh, if you look at uh, page 19 of the ARI paper, You say, last paragraph, Selkirk chose to interpret these as calls to abandon constitutional action and disregarded the unanimous agreement to keep following peaceful constitutional action. Yes. Where 
Was there unanimous agreement to keep following peaceful constitutional action? Um, there was in... Uh, no, no, I, in this, this document. This document? Yeah. yeah, I feel that they've all agreed. The first stage, peaceful what constitutional What if they agreed? They we've just agreed, action. the two of us. Yes. It's one of the few points of agreement today <laughs> that uh, they said they will start with a constitutional struggle. Yes. And then they will complete the revolution through armed struggle. Well, one guy said that. Others well, talked about two different guys. examples. Yes. yes. Two guys out of a big meeting. And yes. others talked about not ruling out armed struggle as not well. Not ruling out armed struggle. Yes. Yes. Not no, ruling out armed no struggle. No reasonable yes. interpretation of this document can suggest that they all agreed unanimously that we are just going to use peaceful constitutional means. Agree? No, I think it. I think it feels it. The, so, the clearly the sense from it is that peaceful. Everyone, you know, that you cited peaceful constitutional so means for now. But we don't rule out. Yeah, um, let me understand uh, the way you read documents. My point is. Now let me finish. When I, the way I use Dr. the documents. Tom, let me finish. Okay, but Tom. you're dealing with things that don't have to do with my argument. Ugh. I just want to let find me that out. finish. It has got everything to do with your argument. I disagree. The way. If a document says we will first, for the time being, use constitutional means, we will get into power, and then we will achieve the fully socialist system through an armed struggle. Uh, no, not when we get into power, right? They said that if armed struggle is necessary for us to achieve socialism, then we would... Pick up arms. Or rather, the first stage is it's to not, eliminate colonialism. Yeah. Eliminate colonialism. Eliminate colonialism. And colonialism. second, overthrow the semi feudal society and establish a social, so, socialist system. And to do that, yes, those were the we same, will use uh, both methods. Uh, yes, the, those objectives now, to overthrow colonialism and, over, and achieve socialism were also the stated objectives now, of the People's Action the Party. The document says that. Yes. And you say. The document says they all unanimously agreed on a peaceful constitutional struggle. What I wrote was that there was a unanimous agreement to keep following peaceful constitutional action, which is why didn't assessment. you mention that they also said that they will resort to armed struggle if necessary? Because they haven't resorted to armed struggle. I can say many things, but if I don't break the law, right? If I now, you know, think, well, maybe in, in a year's time, uh, if necessary, I will steal a loaf of bread to keep right. myself fed. So, you know, you, you don't arrest me for that. If they right? say they My are point going is that to... Selkirk says that they are communist controlled. And there's nowhere in this document that says they are communist controlled. Right? I never we'll argued that Selkirk they are not communist. I never argued we will that come to... communism doesn't exist. We will Selkirk come to says Selkirk. they are communist Can controlled. Can you please stop? Uh, that was dumb. Could you please Sorry, I'm just trying to make a, a point. Yeah. Just, uh, no, answer the questions you first. are trying yeah. to, with, with respect, you are trying to just confuse the point. No, this is my argument. Let me finish. Black and white. No, black and white, I'm referring you to it. Selkirk chose to interpret these as calls to abandon constitutional action disregarded their unanimous agreement to keep following peaceful constitutional action. You make it sound that, oh, you know, they all came together, they all agreed on a peaceful constitutional action, and yet Selkirk chose to interpret it as calls to abandon constitutional action. Mm -hmm. If you read the document, it's completely different. What they were I talking disagree. about, let me finish. Okay. What they were talking about is we need to overthrow the colonialists, but whoever takes over is not going to hand over power to us. Let's all be clear. And we will need to engage in armed struggle. And so we be, keep both options open. And in yes. fact, both will have to be used. Both options open, yes. And both will have to be used. Some people do say that, yes. 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 How can you conclude from that that there was unanimous agreement that peaceful methods only will be used? Because they said that in the immediate future, we will keep following constitutional action. It's quite, it's quite, it's right there in black I, and white. In the future, if they break the I law, see, then I you see, arrest them for it. I right? see how you use documents. May I refer to the um, minutes of the uh, committee of selection that picked this committee, right? It only says the following people were selected for the committee. 
it uh, it doesn't uh, then include a lot of other discussion around who was was picked. Do we then assume that it was unanimous um, based on 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 the the minutes? I mean, I, minutes are one version, and I, this is a, dis a report by a mole. I think you know. So I, my I point. I don't know what you're now saying. I think you're thrashing around a little bit. No, no, no. This document may yes. not be reliable. It's only the minutes. No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. That's that not is what exactly saying. what you just said. No, I disagree. Mm -hmm. Now, let's just look at what you say and what Selkirk was saying. Look at the 11th of December, 1962, telegram from him, paragraph 2b. This is step 37, paragraph 2b. Recent security intelligence has shown more clearly than ever before that Barisan socialists are communist controlled and that although they see at least no feasible alternative to constitutional tactics, they have weighed the merits of more direct action and would not hesitate to take it if it would pay. Let's deal with the second point. He is absolutely correct Mm -hmm. in that part of the statement, correct? Yeah, but the Thank crucial you. point is that the Barisan are communist controlled. That's what he said. No. That was the basis for coal store, that, that they were communist controlled. It, the Tham, coal store was not justified on the basis of what they may or may not do. We haven't come to coal store. We are dealing with this document you, you and said, your characterization. I, if we can call up the transcript, you said, let us come to coal store. I know, so but we, we haven't yet come store. to the actual arrests. Now let's deal with these two documents. They, they are the precursors. Let's go back to paragraph 19. You are talking about Selkirk. You say the evidence which Selkirk cited was accounts of two post-referendum Barisan meetings. Yes. Barisan members had complained that the constitution was pointless if it was so easily manipulated and asking if there was another way forward. Most people will interpret that as armed struggle. Mm -hmm. That is an option, yes. You say that Barisan members had raised the question. You then say Selkirk chose to interpret these as calls to abandon constitutional action and disregarded their unanimous agreement to keep following peaceful constitutional action. Yes. Now, that is simply untrue characterization of the document because there was no unanimous agreement just to keep following peaceful constitutional ac action, there was unanimous agreement that for the time being, they will follow the constitutional actions, but armed struggle was also necessary and they will continuously keep it open. And as you agreed, as you agreed just now, they see no feasible alternative to constitutional tactics. They weighed the merits of more direct action and would not hesitate to take it if it would pay. You agreed that's an accurate interpretation of the document. Yes. Here you are talking about that aspect. You are not talking about communism. You are only talking about his interpretation on what actions they will take. You are telling the reader Selkirk's interpretation on what action they will take is wrong. Well, reading it again now, with the benefit of all the points I've made, would you agree that this statement should have been reworded to say, Selkirk, you should say there were, they were asking if there was another way forward. Mm -hmm. so they unanimously agreed that they will stick to constitutional means now, but also keep the armed option open and agreed that it was, it was necessary to keep it side by side with the constitutional action. And then you should say Selkirk chose to interpret these calls as them saying there was no feasible alternative to constitutional tactics now, but they weighed the merits of more direct action and would not hesitate to take it if it would pay. 
That's how you should have characterized Selkirk's assessment. Agree? Um, are we going to look at the other document as well? We will, first on this document. Okay, then let's look at the other document because it's based first on both. On this then document, we will have a discussion about what Selkirk, uh, whether on Selkirk's this document, assessment. Do you agree? But I cite two documents. Let's yes. look at the second one. So, Dr. Tom, could you answer the question on this document first this before we move on to the other one? Just based on this document, that yes. should be worded Just differently. Just based on this document, I accept that uh, I could have worded uh, what I said better. Yes. Thank you. Now, let's look at um, the other document now. Because these are all central to your arguments. 30th September 1962. Look at paragraph two. At the meeting which lasted for most of the day, source reports that chalk who had recently taken control or the effective control of the organizing sub Sorry, I'm reading the document. My apologies. Sorry. Source reports, this is 30th September 1962. Source reports that the meeting of Barisan Socialist officials to interpret and discuss new lines of policy and tactics laid down by the Secretary General was continued at the Barisan Socialist headquarters on 30th September. Para two, the meeting was instructed to consider the subject under the following three headings. No matter how the situation changes, the next objective of the struggle is to overthrow the PAP government. B, in the event of the realization of the phony merger, the party should secure election of members to the Devan Rakyat. C, the necessity for uniting the left-wing forces of a, on a pan-Malayan basis to overthrow the right-wing federation government. Okay, para seven. One speaker repeated the warning given at the meeting of 23rd September 19 that they should not entertain any illusions about the existing system of parliamentary democracy, again cited the Indian government's intervention. They should reassure themselves, however, when their fortunes were low with the knowledge that in many countries, the leftist forces had encountered similar setbacks and that the reactionaries would fall in the end. Para 8, he talks about Lee Kuan Yew not willing to clash with them. Uh, they shouldn't take the another form of struggle first. They must consolidate and uh, they must not abandon the constitutional struggle and maintain it under the party's collective leadership. Now, uh, Mr. Shammugam, um, based on you, what you've read here has reminded me why the Communist Party in Kerala was referred to. So the reason why in the previous document they were referred to was because they won, they legitimately and fairly won an election, and then the Congress, uh, Federal National Government of India, then uh, wouldn't let them take power. I understand that. Yes, okay. But the point I referred to India was to point out to you that you're completely wrong in suggesting that the struggle was somehow just related to anti-colonialism because India had been independent by that time for 15 years. Well, yes, but they cancelled the result of a legitimate election uh, which was fairly finish, won by please? the Communist Party. I haven't finished. That, therefore, that makes the point I've been making to you for some considerable time now. Even after independence, the reactionary forces will not lightly hand over power. Look at India. Same with us, mm -hmm. and therefore, armed struggle is necessary. We Maybe must necessary. Yes, if yeah. necessary, if and necessary. we should continue to keep it open. I have never denied that in my work. Well, we will see <laughs> okay. the way you have characterized it. Okay. Now, para the paragraph eight makes it clear that the adherence to constitutional struggle was conditional as long as it were available to them, correct? It was conditional 
in that sense. Yes, yes, of course, yes. Right. If it's taken now, away, they can't follow it. Now, let's uh, look at uh, some, sorry, but some communist theory. Um, Mr. Shamu, may I interject and point out, this discussion we're having is already uh, established. Uh, there have been historians arguing these exact points. Uh, and so uh, I have already debated these, and I can summarize this argument if you want. And it's a difference of subjective interpretation. I would like to just go through, and if you, I ask you to bear with me. Okay. okay. Lenin's theory, dictatorship is ruled based directly upon force and unrestricted by any laws. The revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat is a rule worn and maintained by the use of violence by the proletariat against the bourgeoisie, rule that is unrestricted by any laws. You accept that's fairly standard communist theories put out by Lenin, correct? Lenin, yeah, sure, yes. Yeah. Now, you look at the last paragraph of this document, mm. paragraph 14. Mm. What are we looking at now? Just read that paragraph to yourself, the last paragraph, paragraph 13. Sorry, third, 14. Tell me when you're done. I think you would have done by now. Yes. Yes. Shok Ka Tong says, he was referring to a transitional phase where the bourgeoisie will be allowed to exist, correct? Yeah. Yes. Final phase, they won't be allowed to exist, correct? Mm -hmm. Because this is a transitional phase. Yes. Yeah, I suppose. So that fits in with the theory on the dictatorship of the proletariat, where the bourgeoisie will cease to exist, correct? Mm, it, it aligns with it, yes. In a sense, that's perfect when communism reaches its perfect uh, sort of uh, position, correct? Without, and there well, will be I'm no elections. I'm not an expert on communism, if you're, if you're saying that. I'm, I, have no I think as a historian, you know enough to know that communism, the final stage, it's perfection and there are no elections, correct? Perfection, sorry? Well, okay, let me leave out the word perfect. The ultimate society that communism aims for is dictatorship of the proletariat without any elections, correct? I, I can't comment. You can't on answer. That. Look, look. I'm on not a fairly an basic on... point on communism, okay? Yeah. Now, <clears throat> let me show you a statement by. Yong Kuo, who's the Deputy Secretary General of the CPM. Mm -hmm. This appears in Aloysius Chin, Communist Party of Malaya, page 72. I think um, I will have to read it out to you, okay? In the months before the Baling peace talks held in December 1955, Yong Kuo, the Deputy Secretary General of the CPM, wrote several appreciations on the correct tactics to be adopted by the party in the changed political circumstances in the then Federation of Malaya. One of them clearly showed that it was the intention of the CPM to trick the Alliance Party into the temporary pact. He wrote, meaning Yong Kuo, Undoubtedly, our tactics today are to join with the Tunku in a common effort to get rid of the colonial rule of the British, Impe British imperialist. After there is a state of peace, we can then immediately win over more support of the broad masses of the people and to take a step further by overthrowing the Tunku's bourgeoisie dictatorship and changing it into a joint dictatorship of all races and state. In this, Yong Kuo was following the technique adopted by Lenin, who stated, Communists must be able to agree to sacrifices, even if need be to resort to all sorts of stratagems, maneuvers, illegal methods, evasions, and subterfuges in order to achieve their end. If the party had been accorded legal status, it would not have given 
of the illegal and subversive methods. The essence of communist strategy is deception and preparedness to resort to violence when necessary, and such a strategy demands the adoption of secret and illegal methods, even when the party has legal status. Yong, Yong Kuo may be quoted again, we are no believers in legality and are certainly not content with open and legal struggle. Our aim is to cover up and support an illegal struggle by means of an open legal activities. Open and legal activities are used to create the <coughs> conditions in preparation for a struggle to overthrow the enemy with illegal revolutionary methods. Are you aware of this document? A young yes. course yes, document? Young course, you yes. are. That's classic communist theory, correct? Yes. Thank you. Well, I think just now you were saying you were not aware. Now, of Yong Kuo? No, I'm not aware of about Yonko. classic communist theory. Uh, you uh, have agreed with me about this transitional phase leading to the final phase that is referred to, which pretty much is a summing up of this second document. Can I suggest to you now going back again to your ARI document, the point stands, now that you've seen all of this, there's nothing in the second document that in any way suggests there was unanimous agreement to give up armed struggle. Well, can we go back to the second document? We've just gone through the second document. No, we went through two paragraphs of it. Okay, please go through. Tell me what suggests that there was unanimous agreement to give up armed struggle in the future and no, just to stick to constitutional struggle. Not, I, does it say, did I write give up armed struggle? Well, I wrote keep to, wait, where is You it? want to go through the half an hour again that we had on paragraph four at page 19. I'm quite happy to do that. Okay. But I think the conclusion of that discussion, long to and tortuous keep discussion. To keep following peaceful constitutional action. Well, I it, would include something like for, you know, uh, as long as it was available or possible, yes. I, I accepted that uh, perhaps I could re have rephrased this better. Even but fundamentally, with, I think my point stands that they were going to keep following so peaceful constitutional action. We don't action. need to read all the other paragraphs of the second document. Even with the second document, what Selkirk had said in his telegram was the correct interpretation, which is that... The virus under communist controlled is wrong. No, no, I didn't say that. Please don't interrupt. They, although they see no feasible alternative to constitutional tactics, they weighed the merits of more direct action and would not hesitate to take it if it would pay is a correct interpretation of both documents put together. Yes, yes. 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 Communist control. So your earlier suggestion that somehow hmm? the second document qualifies the first document is inaccurate. I and didn't when suggest it comes that. to page 19. I just asked if we could look at both documents since I cited both of them. I don't want to waste time by referring to the Maybe transcript. Maybe we could just, could we scroll to the end? Is this the final paragraph of this document? I'm, I well, this remember. is the final paragraph yes. that I have. Yes. So, and I assume it is a final paragraph. As far as I can tell, in all these paragraphs, everyone agrees to continue to follow peaceful constitutional action for the time immediate being. future. And they recognize that there is going to be a transitional phase. And yes, I accept down the road, you know, armed struggle is, they never explicitly ruled the armed struggle. It's possible. Some people felt necessary. Yes. Um, and others less so. And the problem, um, but peaceful, Dr. Tham, keep following peaceful constitutional struggle. I think you were good enough to agree. Looking at it again, page 19, the suggestion that, you know, he disregarded the unanimous agreement to keep following constitutional action. The way you have put it is misleading and it should have been better phrased and what, doc, what Lord Selkirk said in his telegram and you, on that second point is accurate. On the second point, yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. Now let's... You agree that um, by 19, in 1961, the CPM was completely controlled by China? Jinping says that. If he says that. So do I you accept no, that? 
Jinping says that. So if he's the Secretary General of CPM, and north of the causeway, I have not disputed, you know, I, I don't work on uh, that aspect of the CPM. Well, we are now talking about the CPM, which uh, where I think earlier in the discussions we agreed, as far as the CPM was concerned, Malaya and Peninsula Malaya and Singapore were one territory. And the CPM on both sides ultimately were controlled. There's one CPM which deals with Peninsula Malaya and Singapore, mm -hmm. Communist Party of Malaya, with different cadres. I mean, there's the, the, the Taiwanese government claims to govern all of China as well. I'm we are not, not, sure we are not talking about the physical control yet. Uh, you were good enough to agree uh, much earlier that for the CPM, they looked at Peninsula Malaya and Singapore together. Are you qualifying yes. that? Peninsula Malaya includes Singapore, yes. Thank you. And the CPM was controlled by China, according to Jinping, as of 1961. Do you According accept Jinping, that? Yeah, if he says that. Thank you. Sure. And you know that in 1961, there was a discussion I read to you. It was CPM was financed by China, and they agreed to resume armed struggle, correct? Yes, you've read that, yes. 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 Now, now let's look at the telegram of another telegram, 7th of December. These are all British records, which you are quite keen to get into. Um, Mr. This is from Moore, Deputy UK High Commissioner, to Ian Wallace. You have seen this document, right? Yes. Right. Now, let's go through this carefully. I enclose copies of reports which came to us last month from a reliable and well-placed source on two meetings held at the headquarters of the Barisan Socialist last September. Okay? We have seen those. These reports are of considerable importance, not only for what they reveal of the future intentions of Barisan Socialists, but because they provide more conclusive evidence than we have had hitherto for the belief that Barisan socialists are communist controlled. Now, you probably won't agree, but you ask, isn't it obvious from this telegram that Mr. Moore has become convinced that Barisan socialists is communist controlled? Oh, I never denied that. Uh, yes, of course, they, they, they believed that there was communist control, sure. Thank you. They, therefore, have a clear bearing on the attitude to be taken to the Federation's request for repressive action as we took the opportunity of telling Lord Lansdowne and John Martin about them during their recent visits. It has never been disputed that the communists in Singapore are following United Front tactics and that Barisan socialists is their principal instrument on the political front. The British believed that, correct? In fact, even before yes. the two documents. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. Thank you. There was belief, yeah. But unless one was prepared to accept uncritically the evidence supplied by Lee Kuan Yew in his battle for merger, there was nothing very definite to go on apart from circumstantial evidence and stale security records. Yes. Now, however, there can no longer be much doubt as to what we are up against in Barisan Socialists. The report on the first of the two meetings shows that those engaging in the discussions were communists examining, quite frankly, how best to achieve their ends. Furthermore, we can see that the communist influence within Barisan Socialists is not confined to the Central Executive Committee, but extends to branch committee level. This is not to say that all members of these committees are communists. There were some notable absentees from the two meetings but the communists seem to be sufficiently entrenched to control policy and action. And knowing what we now do about the extent of communist penetration within Barisan Socialists, it will be difficult to acquit many of the other leading members as unwitting dupes. Now, you are aware that uh, the Secretary General of Barisan Socialists attended the second of the two meetings, correct? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Oh, whom is not an answer. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. So the British were absolutely convinced, based on the two documents, that Barisan Socialists was deeply infiltrated by communists, and the rest, who may not be communists, know that the communists were all over the place in Barisan Socialists. That's what the British believed, correct? Uh, that's what Moore believed here. Yes. Yes. He is a Deputy High Commissioner. Now, Deputy Commissioner. Yes, I'm sorry. The substance of the discussion at the two meetings is also interesting. It is clear that although the communists and Barisan socialists value the armed struggle highly in theory, they see no other practical cause for them at present but to pursue their aims by constitutional means. At the same time, they face realistically their difficulties in winning support amongst the Malays and English educated classes and recognize that the reactionaries are unprincipled enough to intervene if need be to cancel any electoral victory they might win. They take comfort from the belief that in the long run, repression works to their advantage because it increases their mass following. Leaving out the reference to uh, communists, the rest of the description is accurate of the two meetings, based on our discussion earlier. Leaving out the reference to the communists? Yes. Uh, support from the, um, mm, mm, yeah, it seems reasonable. Sure. Thank you. Mm. This new evidence will naturally be taken into account in the security assessment that is being prepared jointly by the Singapore and Federation Special Branches for consideration by the Internal Security Council. This assessment is taking a long time to come forward, mainly because the first drafts were on the wrong lines. So and so has now tried to ensure that we eventually get a sensible assessment paper by preparing a draft framework. The Federation Special Branch are working on this framework, and I hope the result may be rather better paper than at once seemed, at one time seemed likely. So they weren't happy with the previous paper, but now with this new evidence, what Moore wanted was a paper that was professional and had a proper assessment, correct? Uh, actually, no. This was a political issue that was discussed uh, with um, the uh, Secretary of State for the Colonies, uh, Duncan Sands, about the exact thrust of the special branch paper. Um, if I remember correctly, the objection was uh, fundamentally that um, special branch in Singapore were not willing to endorse certain conclusions because of a lack of evidence. And so what uh, the British pushed, pushed through because of these, uh, this new evidence um, is uh, a new paper uh, that would justify the arrest, which already had, uh, if I remember correctly, been agreed to. Oh wait, sorry. What? Year? Yes, had already been agreed to before this uh, at a meeting in London between Duncan Sands, Lee Kuan Yew, and Tunku Abdul Rahman. So they, what they needed was a special branch paper to justify the arrest, oh. and the paper that special branch came up with simply didn't have any evidence. And so with this, they created a new paper that they felt was now, stronger. You agree <clears throat> that paragraph three of this telegram was accurate as long as you leave out the reference to communists and you agree that paragraph two accurately sets out what the British, or at least what Moore believed, the deputy commissioner. Let's take that for the time being. He says, now, however, in paragraph two, there can no longer be much doubt as to what we are up against in Barisan Socialists. The report on the first of the two meetings shows that those engaging in the discussion were communists examining, quite frankly, how best to achieve their ends. <clears throat> Furthermore, we can see that the communist influence within Barisan Socialists is not confined to the CEC. I know you don't agree, but we are now looking at what the British believed. You agreed earlier that this is what they believed. 
So they believed that Barisan Socialist was in, deeply infiltrated by communists. It was not confined to the CEC, but extends to the branch level. They believed that it is a serious problem and they believed that violence was not being ruled out. And they said effectively, in, by implication, we were not prepared to accept whatever Lee Kuan Yew said in his battle for merger. But this new evidence shows us what is happening. Now, if they believed all of that, then the case for the security action is quite clear. Would you accept that? If they honestly believed all of that? First of all, um, both... Now please answer my question. Well, I'm trying to answer your question. It's capable of a yes or no, followed by an explanation. Uh, well, then I'll just say no and explain. Okay. okay. So first of all, both Selkirk and Moore backtrack from this position. Uh, in later documents, they are much, much more circumspect about uh, their assertions that there is communist control um, and about the necessity of arrest. Yes. Um, well, <clears throat> Dr. Thum, can I then say, as of the 7th of December, this represented the, as you said just now, this represented the British views. As of the 7th of December, subject to whatever retractions later on, based on this, they believed that a security action was necessary. Um, and second of all... No, 7th of December. Second, 7th of December. Yes. Uh, this, this reflected their position as of this uh, document. Um, sorry, I had something else I wanted to mention, but... Uh, well, can you just listen to the question? Long, long day, sorry. Yes. As of the 7th of December... We have agreed that this is what they honestly believed, paragraph two. And paragraph three, you say, so apart from the word communist, the rest of what is set out is accurate reflection of the notes. Based on that, as of 7th of December, they were entitled to mm. believe. They had an honest belief that security action was necessary. Yes? Um, as of... It's 7th December? Uh, subject to whatever retractions they may have made later on. Uh, but they had already decided on security action before this point, right? I'm asking you, as of 7th of, of December, year. they believed. Uh, this, the document needs to be understood in the context that security action had already been decided on and they were looking for justification so for the security action. Are you now changing your evidence to say this is not their honest assessment? Because earlier on you were prepared to accept that this was their honest view. Um, I, I would, hmm. Hmm, how do I phrase this in a brief way that will uh, satisfy you? No, um, simply, th did they honestly believe, I mean, does this set out their honest view as of 7th of December? Simple it, question. It sets out an honest view on which uh, detentions could be carried out. Yes. Thank you.